afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Elva, for your uh, warm welcome. Uh, as I said, my, my name is Richard Smith. I'm the director of the Tech Museum of Wington, uh, which essentially means I have the best job in the world uh, because I get paid uh, to hang around on these things every day. And it's a, a pleasure uh, to run the Tank Museum, which is, I'm sure you're aware, the world's finest collection uh, of tanks, armoured fighting vehicles, established in 1923 as the British National Collection, telling the stories of tanks and the people who served with them. And it's a tremendous honour to be here on the centenary of the first day uh, that tanks were used on the battlefield. And it's a day that heralded really a new day, uh, a new era in the history of armoured warfare. And I'm going to very talk, quickly talk you through uh, three things. Have a quick look at uh, why it was tank were needed, uh, how did they emerge, and what did they do? And I'm going to try and nail that in five minutes. How hard could it be? Right. For those of you who aren't familiar with early 20th century history, your quick history lesson is by the summer of 1914, August was in two armed camps. And it only needed a spark. Uh, to kick it all off. And the spark happened with the assassination of Archduke Ferdinand in Sarajevo, uh, and the most enormous war the world had ever seen until that moment started. And initially, that war was a war of movement and manoeuvre. However, when the German army was stopped on the Marne, uh, by the French, uh, it all stopped. It ground to a halt. And you ended up with people taking up fortified positions in, in these entrenchments in a world where the uh, defensive technology reigned supreme. So the challenge for the British and the French at that point was the Germans were in the wrong country. And the British and the French had to be attacking, but the offensive warfare was incredibly difficult to manage. Offensive warfare is traditionally very much more difficult than defensive warfare. So in October 1914, about three or four weeks after that Western Front started grinding to a halt, uh, this gentleman, uh, who's called Ernest Swinton, really, he was the, really the person who first emerged with the concept of that an armoured vehicle and caterpillar tracks might be one of the ways in which you can use technology to start solving this incredibly complex battlefield problem. He had an early political sponsor who was very well connected. Anyone know who this guy is? <laughs> <laughs> So this is a, a young Winston Churchill. Uh, Churchill was in charge of the Admiralty at the time, he was in charge of the British Navy, uh, but Churchill um, enjoyed the concept of having his own private army uh, and was very much involved in setting up uh, the, the Land Ships Committee, which was the, the, the brain box that started developing the new vehicles. So what did they do? Well, within a year of starting this process by Swinton, the world's first prototype tank was produced. And rather conveniently, that first prototype tank is still with us. And it's, if you want to come and see it, you'll see it at the Tank Museum uh, in Bovington, in Dorset. Now, that prototype was actually a failed prototype, because the purpose of this was to try and get through that fortified position to smash their way through to the, uh, what was known at the time as the green fields beyond. And this one, it was trying to cross the trench, would effectively plunge in nose first. It didn't work. So a guy called Walter Wilson came up with a beautiful solution where he took that uh, rectangular box and skewed it into a rhomboid shape. And that meant that the front of the vehicle was across the other side of the trench before it started tipping. It's a beautifully, beautifully simple solution to a very complex problem. So they came up with the idea, and they then needed to get the people to put into those vehicles. And this is a, an example of an advertisement, uh, an advertisement in a motorcycle magazine, the, effectively the people who are going to become the new tank crews. Now, what do you think about this, especially those of you involved in the gaming world? If you think about the kind of people at the turn of the last century who were involved in reading motorcycle magazines, these would be young men, particularly, who were early adopters of technology. The people reading these magazines, I know some guys here, for instance, from PC Gamer, would be the same sort of people uh, reading this sort of magazine as read about video games today. This is your technology geeks go to war. And here they are. 
this is D Company, heavy branch machine gun corps, and that picture is the team photo when they're doing the train about gunnery. And those were the first people to go into battle in a tank. So what happened to my last one? I'm glad you asked me that. They attacked here at this part of the Somme. Now, for the British people here, the Somme absolutely dominates the British view of the First World War. Uh, the Somme is where these two bears, these two massive armies between the British, the Germans, and the French as well, are battering each other to death. Uh, this is the cauldron of the First World War. And this was where the tanks were going to go into action on the 15th of September 1916. Vehicles that were being used were these, these are Mark Vaughan tanks. Um, and bear in mind, Mark Vaughan tank, this is the bleeding edge of military technology in the First World War. There is nothing more advanced than this anywhere in the world. And this is what these early adopters of technology are going into battle with. It is not a comfortable way to go into battle. You can see a number of features on it. There's, there's some things that make this unusual. You've got the steering wheel that back against kind of the rig on the top. That's to stop hand grenades from resting on the top of the tank. So if someone throws a whole load of grenades on the top, it bounces off. Very nice solution. Uh, but inside they've got a bus engine, it's deafeningly loud, the temperature goes up to somewhere between 120 and 150 Fahrenheit, uh, you're being, so you're being slowly cooked. Um, as a loaded bus engine, it's leaching carbon monoxide into the crew compartments, an incredibly uncomfortable place to live. Uh, while all this is going on, there's no suspension. Uh, so if, it, if you're in a first world war tank, which I have been, um, you feel every bump goes all the way through. Uh, this is an intensely uncomfortable experience. And while people are shooting you, there are lots of people out there who want to kill you. Uh, and if a bullet hits the outside of the tank, while the outside is armoured and hardened, the inside metal is actually fairly soft. So actually, if a bullet impacts the outside of the tank, it breaks off the flake of metal off the inside, and that goes zinging across. Uh, they would describe the guys coming out of these things looking like they've just been in a boxing match. Uh, this is a brutal way to go into business. Um, at least four of the tank commanders uh, who reached the German lines that day have nervous breakdowns. So what happened? Well, these are simple stats, uh, which you can digest in your own time. But these are simple stats that summarise an attack by 150,000 men that morning. And of those 150,000 men, 30,000 became casualties. This was a brutal fight. Those tanks, though, that reached German lines began a new form of warfare, and a form of warfare that we're commemorating today. So what's the perspective looking back on that? Uh, well, I've got three perspectives for you here. This is one from Douglas Haig. Douglas Haig was the commander of British forces uh, throughout uh, most of the First World War. And this was his point. Whenever tax advanced, we took our objectives. Um, these were incredibly effective where they were. It was early technology. Early technology, those of you who are always buying the latest kit, Samson will confirm to you it doesn't always work as well as you would like it to the first time. This is early technology, but where it worked, you could see enough of a flavour that this was going to change the future of warfare. An order for a thousand goes in very rapidly. And what you get the following year is you get a couple of hundred attacking in the summer at Passchendaele. Year off, uh, later on that year at Combra, you get over 300 attacking, you get over 400 attacking by the time of 1918. So Hay was convinced. Churchill. Uh, <coughs> Churchill throughout his career was looking for the silver bullet. Uh, he was always looking for the simple solution that would solve everything. And actually, he felt that tanks could have been that in the First World War. Churchill actually felt that too few were used on the first time. There, there, there's an extraordinarily challenging dilemma <coughs> of you've got new technology <coughs> to use it straight away when it's potentially going to be most effective. What do you wait? Churchill was actually very frustrated that the tanks were used too early in that day. But for the soldiers on the ground, those tanks brought new hope. The soldiers on the ground, the British soldiers, their accounts of British soldiers laughing as they're seeing tanks advance across the battlefield. They're laughing because they're looking at this new technology thinking, finally, we have got something that they haven't got. And they saw that the purpose of this was to save their lives in pursuit of victory in the First World War. And even now, you, uh, in Afghanistan, there is a, a wonderful uh, quotation from a US Marine who reflected on his experience by saying that there were two types of soldiers. Uh, one type who had fought with tanks, 
and one type who haven't. And those who have worked with tanks never wanted to be without them again. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much.